Welcome. I want to get started. We have a full agenda going on today. I want to welcome all of you to Johnson County Community College. I'm Ramona Nelson. I'm the president of the student affiliate AAUW organization on campus. We partnered with the Veterans Club on campus to uh, bring a wonderful Brigadier General to our campus to speak today. First of all, though, we are going to present our colors. So I'd like to present the Washington High School Color Guard, who will be presenting our colors. Would you all please stand? be seated. <laughs> okay. uh, and now I'd like to uh, ask our President Sopcich for the Johnson County Community College to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. And didn't that Washington High School Color Guard do a great job? Let's serve a round of applause. You know, and, and also thanks to the American Association of University Women. Um, it's been a pleasure meeting some of the membership here, and thank you for support of this, as well as for our Veterans Affairs, our Veterans Program, a Veterans Club. They do a great job on campus. It's my honor to introduce um, 
and I get to do this a lot. As president, you get to introduce people all the time. But today, it's a very special opportunity to introduce retired Air Force Brigadier General Wilma L. Vaught. Welcome to Johnson County Community College. Now, a few things about the Brigadier General. Um, first of all, uh, she spent 28 years in the Air Force, and she retired in 1985 as one of the most highly decorated women in our nation's military history. During the Vietnam War, she was one of the few women serving there who was not a nurse. And remarkably, one of a handful of women ever promoted to the rank of Brigadier General. I've never met a general before, so this has been a special uh, <laughs> honor today. Um, if you, when, when people come to campus like this, they give me pages and pages of their, of their accomplishments. And in the case of the Brigadier Generals, this is no exception. And so I could read you all the types of things that she's done, there's plenty um, over her lifetime in the military. Um, but of all of those accomplishments, I think there's one that I would like to highlight. And that is, if, if you've ever been to Arlington, if you've ever been to DC, in Arlington uh, National Cemetery. Uh, you, as you know, it's a very special place. Um, it's a place to go uh, simply to, to walk, walk around uh, the hollowed grounds and you feel a great sense of our, our nation's history. But before you even get into the, into the cemetery part, uh, there's a memorial there. And that memorial is the Women in Military Service for America's Memorial. And it's the gateway to Arlington National Cemetery. That recognizes, that facility recognizes the commitment and sacrifice of over three million women who've served in our nation's military. Now, a part of this memorial um, is uh, there's like a, a museum inside. And when you go into that museum, uh, it's not just exhibits, um, of which those that are there are fantastic, and it kind of gives you a real sense of what, it, what it's like being a, a, a woman in the military. But what's really, one of the things that I found really moving, because I've been there, uh, were the pieces of correspondence, the letters that were written from women in the military to their families during their times of deployment all around the world. And the folks that I were with were brought to tears by these incredible insights into the lives of those women and what the degree of service has been to their country. That exhibit, that memorial uh, came about, um, well, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. Um, I did a little research on Wikipedia um, before I had this introduction. And what I realized was that it took years upon years of fighting and persistence um, for that thing to become a reality. And the person behind all of that was retired Air Force Brigadier General Wilma L. Vaught. So on behalf of all of those who respect all that you've done, in the military, but as well as for your lasting legacy, which will be that memorial, I'd like to thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. And it is a pleasure indeed to be here with you. You know, when you get into my age bracket, it's a pleasure to be anyways. <laughs> and to be doing anything. But I am particularly glad to be here today as a part of a celebration of Veterans Day because Kansas City is a special place for us with the, for the Women's Memorial. And that's because one of our World War II Army nurses lived here in the Kansas City area. And when she registered, she wrote some words. She served in the China, Burma, India uh, part of the war. And it wasn't easy being there. But she wrote these words, and I kept them. And as we continued on with the memorial and we decided to have glass tablets on the top that formed the uh, sunlight uh, area over the, the main hallway of the memorial, 
Hers was the first quotation we selected, and it is in a place of honor, and it has her name. And this is what she said. Let the generations know that women in uniform guaranteed their freedom, that our resolve was just as great as the brave men who stood among us. And with victory, our hearts were just as full and beat just as fast, and the tears fell just as hard. So, as we think about those words, what struck us was when she said, let the generations know that women in uniform also guaranteed their freedom. And that's what the memorial is about. And she recognized that early on. And interestingly, as we were coming out here, we were at the airport in Washington, D.C. yesterday afternoon. And whom should we sit down by but a fellow with kind of a veteran hat on his head with a purple heart on it. And we started talking to him. And he was from, is from Kansas City. And his name is Sergeant Randy Hall. And it was an education to talk to him. Kansas City should be very proud of Ann Brim. And they should be equally proud of Sergeant Randy Hall who served in Vietnam. And he left his service there with a wound in his back and the silver star and the purple heart. And the silver star is the next highest medal to the Medal of Honor. That's how great a veteran Randy Hall is. So as you think about Veterans Day this year, I hope you'll think about Ann Brim and Randy Hall. They deserve to be remembered. He had been to Washington for a meeting of Purple Heart recipients. A great guy. And life hasn't been easy for him because he's had his mental pains, his strains, but he has pressed on. But I am here today to talk to you about the history of women in the military. And that goes back a long time. It goes back to uh, when women were just out there, volunteers during the American Revolution, perhaps going with their husbands, and they would be tired, or else they would be injured or killed, and they would pick up the weapon and go on from there. Or during the Civil War, they served as spies. And they just continued on as we became more organized. By the time uh, World War I came, we not only had women nurses who were in the service, but we took some women in as enlisted members. So uh, that's where we were. But we were a long time in deciding it was all right for women to be in the service. And so, in a sense, what I'm going to be speaking about today are the barriers that have been confronting women and what we had to do to come over, to overcome those barriers to get to where we are today, where they have finally de decided after all these years that we would open up all of the, the specialties and women could be in any of them. That doesn't mean necessarily that they will be in all of them but at least being a woman doesn't keep you from being in it. So, as we think about uh, all of this, uh, let's go back to the, to the um, American Revolution. And the first person that uh, is recognized is Margaret Corbin. And she picked up the weapon after her husband had had it. And this was in 19, or 17, uh, uh, 76, and she was injured, uh, permanently disabled. And she, uh, a couple years later, was given a pension for that for the rest of her life. She was the first woman to receive a pension as a result of military action. 
And so she is very famous for that. She is now buried, thanks to the DAR, her remains are at West Point in the cemetery at West Point. So uh, the more, a more interesting, perhaps, in many senses of the word, is a woman named Deborah Sampson. And you can see the various white things that women did and so that they could serve. Because Deborah Sampson decided that she was going to serve during the American Revolution. And of course, they weren't taking women into the army or the Navy to do anything like that. So she disguised herself as a man named Robert Shirtliff, and off she went. She was in combat a couple of times. I think she was in the Battle of Yorktown, Virginia, uh, as one of them. She was injured, took care of the injury herself, so they wouldn't find out that she was a woman. And then she became guilty of a fever, and they called the doctor. And you know, I just have to say that in a matter of seconds, she was no longer a member of the military because he said, this is a woman. And that was the end of it. And she fought with the Continental Congress until she finally got a pension. And uh, when she, after she died, her husband tried to get $600 to cover her, the expenses during her illness and her death and went to the Continental Congress. They didn't give him that. They gave him a pension of $8 a month. And he was the first man, first spouse, to get a pension as a result of his wife's service. So when you think about that, and we've got a couple of Army nurses here, you know, what kind of a physical exam did they have that they couldn't tell the difference between men and women? And we can tell the difference. I used to be in charge of that, so I know we can. So. Um, we had people disguising themselves as men uh, clear up through the Civil War. So it wasn't, and we will never know how many there were because some of them probably never told anybody that they did that. Some of them were found out. Some of them came forward when they found out that they could get uh, several acres of ground if they had served. So then I'd like to move forward to the Civil War. Women were in a couple of the, the intervening small wars. But in the Civil War, we had a tremendous number of women. We had over 600,000 people who were killed in the Civil War. But there were women who went out to the field and rescued the wounded, brought them forward, took care of them, did the, they fixed food for the soldiers to eat did their laundry, and did anybody ask them to do this? No, they just saw a need, and they responded to the need. And uh, I don't know whether anybody here has ever heard of Galena, Illinois. Has anybody ever heard of Galena? Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. So many people. Well, Galena, Illinois ought to be a very famous place because like nine uh, of the Civil War generals came from Galena, Illinois, including Ulysses S. Grant. But when I went there and, and visited uh, the city for the only time in my life, I went to the museum and I found a little pamphlet there that a woman named Clarissa Hobbs had written. And Clarissa's uh, husband was a doctor and he decided to volunteer with the Iowa 12th Regiment. And his wife Clarissa decided that she was going to go with him as a nurse. So she uh, put the children with an aunt, and she prepared herself. And in her little book, this is what she said, how she prepared herself. So those of you who've been in the military, you can think about this. She got a stout new dress, a pair of new calfskin shoes, some necessaries that could be thrown away if need be, a little roll of needles, thread, thimble, and buttons. How many of you took those kind of things with you when you deployed? Uh, not for, I didn't take any of those things. And then, so then off she went to join her husband who had already gone. 
And she said, when I arrived, your grandfather said, I will go up and see Colonel Wood. After a time, Colonel Wood, a West Point man, came down to the hospital tent where I was and received me very courteously. I told him I had come to go with my husband as a nurse. He said, Mrs. Hobbs, there is no provision made for women nurses. And I said, well, I am going, Colonel. I liked her right then. <laughs> and he said, I will go back to headquarters and see what can be done. In about an hour, he returned and said, Mrs. Hobbs, we have thought out a way. Now, if that were today, he would have to send an email to the Pentagon, and in six months, he might have a reply. He said, if uh, you are willing to be uh, enrolled on the roster as a soldier of the Iowa 12th, you can draw your rations and have two blankets issued you, and you can go in that way. Of course, I gladly accepted the plan. So at the end of the book, the little pamphlet she wrote, though I was recognized as a nurse of the Iowa 12, so far there had been no arrangements made for nurses, so I ne never got my $13 per month. But she, then she said, no, the hospital work was never felt burdensome, even though when there was only a board with a blanket for a mattress, or food, hardtack, bacon and coffee, day after day, it was a work for love of native land and humanity. But you see, compensation came when I needed it in the shape of my pension of $12 per month, which all these years Uncle Sam has not withheld. The Lord is good. I want you to think about this whole incident. Think about today. First of all, she had children. What did she do? She put her children with a relative. Iran. What do both men and women who are called to deploy that have children and can't take care of them at home? They usually put them with a relative. Hasn't changed in all these years. Second, no provision made for nurses. If you change that, and in essence that's a part of what it's about, no provision made for women. And that has been one of the biggest barriers to us all along. And it still exists today. And it not only exists for people in the military, it exists for civilians as well. You know, it, it applied to me one time. When I came back from Spain in 1964, I was stationed at McCoy Air Force Base in Orlando, Florida in a bomb wing, a sack bomb wing, B-52s. And uh, so when I was a management analyst, and one day my wing commander told me he wanted me to go down to the air to ground missile squadron and do a study. And he told the commander that he wanted me to do this. So the day before I was supposed to go, the commander came to me and he said, Wilma, we can't do this. And I said, why can't we do it? He said, we don't have a restroom for women. So I said, well, do you have a restroom? And he said, yes. I said, well, tell me about it. How many people or what? Well, he says, it's for one person. And I said, does it have a door? And he said, yes. I said, we don't have a problem. Either you are in it or you are not in it. <laughs> We're going to proceed. So we proceeded. And what has been one of the biggest problems for women in Iraq and Afghanistan? It's that same problem. Restrooms. There aren't any McDonald's or filling stations. And when you go out in the desert, there aren't any bushes to hide behind. <laughs> and so it's a real problem. And sometimes women simply have to go inside a vehicle with, a, with everybody else as a male. And you have to take care of what you have to take care of. But it's a problem, and it continues that way. I am going, Colonel. How have we moved forward so many times when there was no way, seemingly, to go forward? It's when a woman said, I can do that job, and I'm going to. And they proceed to do it. And from then on, they suddenly discovered it's okay for women to do that. 
and it changes and it can change for lots of people because it starts with one woman who says, I am going to do that. And her words about a work for love of native land and humanity. Why do we go in the service? We may go in for many reasons, but let me tell you, why do we serve? We serve for our country, for America, for Americans, because we want Americans to live free. We want our country to be great. We want to have a country like no other one on earth as it is today. And uh, so things haven't changed since the Civil War. We still work for love of native land and humanity. So then, you know, I would be remiss if I failed to mention Dr. Mary Walker, who also served during the Civil War. She was a doctor who had graduated from, college, from school as a doctor, recognized uh, to, to do that kind of thing. And she wanted to go out and work with the soldiers. And the Surgeon General of the Army advertised for doctors because they desperately needed them. She applied. She was turned down. Why? Because she was a woman. The Surgeon General kept advertising. She kept applying. He kept turning her down. And she kept going out there and taking care of soldiers anyway and doing a very, very good job of it. And she was even out uh, away from uh, Washington, D.C., where she spent a good deal of time. And she was uh, captured by the Confederate forces who put her in, in, in prison. She was there five or six weeks and finally was traded for a male lieutenant colonel of the, Federa of the Confederate forces. And she was very proud of that. She bragged to people about how she was traded for a male lieutenant colonel. Well, finally, they did appoint her uh, not as a member of the military, but they gave her a position as a doctor at one of the sort of prisoner of war camps, and she did that. And she was known uh, when she no observed that the surgeons were just unduly uh, by amputation, taking legs and arms. And she started examining soldiers and saying, don't you let them do that because you can recover. And they started fighting and they did recover. And after the war was over, they came and thanked her for what she had advised them to do. But when the war was over, they gave her the, they were, we were then giving the Medal of Honor and she received a Medal of Honor for what she had done for our soldiers. And about 10 or 20 years later, the Army decided it had given out this award too freely and that they should uh, look at the record and see if some of those people should have received it. So they found 900 people that they felt should not have received the Medal of Honor. So they wrote a letter to them and said, send your medal back. We shouldn't have given it to you. They, did, they said it more nicely than that. But that's what the letter in essence said. And I don't know what 899 of them did, but I do know what Dr. Mary Walker did. She didn't send hers back. She kept it. She still had it when she died. And during the bicentennial, there was a woman named Mary Walker who started a drive to get that medal restored to her. And I remember signing that petition. And she got enough publicity that finally it reached the point that either the Army needed to do something or the Congress was going to pass legislation. And the Army reissued it, or re reinstated the medal. And I just figured that Dr. Mary Walker was up there somewhere and she said, I knew it was mine all the time. So that's, and she is the only woman ever to be awarded the Medal of Honor. So when you see a list in the Pentagon of all the Medal of Honor recipients, down toward the bottom is Dr. Mary Walker, because they're in alphabetical order. So uh, then uh, comes the uh, Spanish-American War. And during the Spanish-American War, the Army found that it couldn't get enough male nurses to take care of their sick and wounded. And so they hired 1,500 nurses uh, not uh, as members of the military, even though they put them in uniforms. 
but they hired them to be nurses. And, and they had uh, things that they had to meet. Uh, over 30, plain dressing, dressed in brown or black clothing. Training as a nurse didn't seem to be of any particular interest on the main criteria. So let me see, uh, there may be somebody here who might meet the qualification as over 30 and, you know, in brown or black. I won't try to re-enlist you, I mean, I won't try to enlist you now. But anyway, the net result of this, these women did so well that the Army decided it needed women. It needed women nurses. And in February of 1901, the Army Nurse Corps was uh, authorized and came into be being. Now, they weren't a member of the Army in a total sense. They were a reserve organization, even though they worked every day, reported for duty every day, that they were five days a week. But they had some interesting provisions, number one. There was no provision for retirement in that legislation. Uh, they were not permitted to be married. If they got married, they were immediately discharged. And the most interesting thing, third, was they didn't give them any rank. Why didn't they give them any rank? That was because our male members of Congress said that women should not be ordering men around. Women have been ordering men around since the beginning of time. I mean, what was Eve doing out there with Adam? She was ordering him around, I think. Anyway, uh, that's the way it was. And if you didn't have rank, you didn't get any pay increases because that's what pay is based on, your rank. And it was 1924 before that was finally removed. And the Navy Nurse Corps was created in 1908 with the same provisions uh, as that, no rank. So, World War I came. So we had these women in the Army and Navy Nurse Corps uh, with no rank. And the Secretary of the Navy decided that uh, uh, he would take women into the reserve. And now, interestingly, he had a woman who worked there in the secretary's office who went to see him and said, you know, Mr. Secretary, you know, you can take, I, you can take, legally take women into the reserve. And so he thought about this for six months, men think very slowly. Uh, he thought about this for six months and he decided to do it. And they took about 10,000 women into the Navy, 305 in the Marine Corps, and a handful in the Coast Guard. And uh, interestingly, they were in the reserve and they gave them enlisted rank. So they had rank and we had the nurses with no rank. So uh, that's the way it was. So they served uh, till the, I don't know whether this was a duration plus so many months, but they served through uh, World War I. And when they, the war ended and they got out, many of them were from the Washington, D.C. area, and they went back and they established a, uh, the second American Legion post in existence. And it still exists today. And uh, Marilla Cushman there from our office is a member of that group. Doesn't have many members, but it has survived all these years. Now, we had some other women who served who are recognized over in the World War I Memorial here. And that is, you know, during the war, poor G General John Pershing was having great difficulty with communications because they had only members of the Signal Corps, all men, and they're doing this thing with cords and they didn't want to be doing that, I guess, in the first place. And there was a lot of profanity on the phone system. And so he went back to the Secretary of War and said, I need to get some telephone op women telephone operators. So they went to AT&T and they got about 150 uh, women uh, to go over there to be telephone operators. And they went to Fort Meade and they were trained to be in the Signal Corps. And they were told 
that when the war was over that they would be given veteran status. So off they went and they served and they did a tremendous job. They worked close to the cl close line or to the uh, uh, the, con the conflict lines uh, and they were very brave and they didn't use profanity and uh, they were known as the hello girls and when they came back did they get veteran status they did not and they fought for 45 years before they finally got it and by then most of them were dead so that was uh, sort of the story of uh, world war one there's now we had and of course at world war one these women were raising their right hand swearing to support and defend the constitution and they weren't allowed to vote and uh, for our dedication, we had two women from, who still were alive from World War I in 1997. One of them named Frida ha uh, Hardin, 101 years old, from California, came and spoke. And in her speech, she said, when I served in the Navy, women weren't even allowed to vote. And she sounded like she was still angry about it. And uh, that became one of the issues of the struggle for enactment of the legislation, of the amendment that would allow women to vote. Uh, that there was a car very famous cartoon that showed a, showed a wounded soldier on the field and underneath, with a nurse standing by and underneath it said, would the soldier give this nurse the right to vote? And so that became one of the other issues of that war. So after the war, Congress was so angry at the Secretary of, of the Navy that they passed legislation that said women could not be taken in again like that, that they were not physically or psychologically capable of participating in combat. And there were a number of countries that passed that same type of legis legislation. So. The next big thing that comes along was World War II. And very quickly, the Secretary of War recognized that we needed to get women. And on May 15, 1942, the law creating the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps was formed. Now, that corps uh, was not a part of the Army. It was supported by the Army, but it was not part of the Army. So those women, uh, didn't get veteran status to begin with. They weren't, didn't sign a binding contract. They could have gone home at any time. They didn't. They didn't get any benefits. There were no entitlements for dependents. Um, they gave them sort of different rank than what they gave the military. The Geneva provisions didn't apply to them when they went overseas, and they did go overseas to Italy and to North Africa. And yet today, they are still not entitled to have their remains placed at Arlington National Cemetery. They were finally given veteran status. And um, fortunately, uh, because a, a woman named Mary McLeod Bethune, of a very strong black American in Washington, D.C., who was a friend of Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, she worked with him and with her and they were able to get the, the opportunity for black Americans to be taken into the military, women black Americans to be taken into the uh, military as well. And so there were women into the Women's Army Corps, there were about three in the Navy, and maybe one in the Coast Guard, and that's, uh, that's it. Now in the Army we had the uh, 6888 uh, Postal a battalion which went overseas uh, with the charge of cleaning out uh, warehouses full of mail which hadn't been delivered to the soldiers and they did a magnificent job of it. They worked day and night in England and then they went to France where there were similar problems and got that moved on. So uh, that the planning when they was first uh, took women in was that they thought they might t take in about uh, 85,000 women, that that would be as many as they would need. As soon as the women started reporting for duty, many of the commanders started requesting more women because they were doing such a good job 
and there were requests for a million five hundred thousand women. We were only able to get about four hundred thousand to volunteer during uh, World War II, and they were in the reserve. Uh, they were not a part of the military the same as the men were. And uh, they were in for the duration plus six months. Uh, so <clears throat> we had uh, the Army nurses and the WACs and the Navy nurses served in every theater of operation. Now toward the end of the war, the Navy enlisted women, the waves got to go to Hawaii as did some Marines and a handful of Coast Guard women got to go to Alaska. And then we had the um, uh, women Air Force service pilots uh, who thought, who kept fighting all through the war, or through the time they were in the war, uh, faring aircraft, that they'd be made a part of the military. They couldn't get the military to authorize that or the Congress to do it, so they never did uh, through that period of time. They flew over 60 million miles ferrying aircraft. 38 of them were killed in plane crashes. And so it was a, a, a magnificent effort that they put forth. And it was 1977 before they finally got legislation passed and uh, got veteran status. And, but that didn't include uh, remains placed in Arlington National Cemetery, and just recently they had a big publicity drive for that, and that was added uh, at long last. So uh, that also the uh, Civil uh, Air Force was uh, created, and uh, Civil Air Patrol, I mean, and we had women pilots uh, going out and finding planes that had been shot down and there they were. So uh, we had, uh, uh, when you come, when you look at the, at how many served the 400,000, at the end of the war, there were some 266,000 women still serving and about 12 million men or 2.2% were there. And women did all kinds of things they'd never done before, they were airplane, uh, aircraft mechanics, they were cryptologists, uh, they were just everywhere doing things. So, uh, as a result of this, Admiral or General Marshall and Eisenhower decided they should keep a Corps of Women in the military so they didn't have to start from scratch if we had another crisis like that. And so, June 12, 1948, came the Armed Services Women's Integration Act, and that is when women officially became members, full-fledged members of the military. So when did we really become members? 1948. And I want you to know I graduated from high school in June of 1948, and I never thought at all about going into service. Not one minute. Didn't even know that legislation had passed. But that legislation had some interesting um, three interesting provisions. And the first one was that the uh, total number of women could not exceed 2%. And I think that may have come from the 2.2% that were there serving at the end of the war. And second, that women could not be assigned for duty on combat aircraft or combat ships. And the WACs were prohibited from serving and being near combat and women could not be admirals or generals. And as a matter of fact, colonels and captains, or O6s, for those of you who know the numeric, uh, there were, you either were chief of a nurse corps or you were the director of the woman in one branch of the service to be a colonel or a captain. There were nine positions, that's all. So when I came in the service in 1957, there was one colonel's position that I could aspire for, the director of women in the Air Force. And um, so, uh, why couldn't women be generals or admirals? Well, that's because there are male members of Congress, considering this, said that women would be at the age when they would be considered for promotion, that they might be going through menopause. 
And if they were going through menopause, they might make irrational decisions. And we all know that men always make rational decisions. So we couldn't have these women making irrational decisions. And that's the way it was. So, you know, I couldn't aspire to be a general because of uh, this decision. So, uh, the Korean War came. And basically that was an Army Nurse Corps war from the standpoint of women. Because there was one place that had some Air Force nurses and the rest of them stationed in Korea during the war were Army nurses. So it was a very difficult service time for women. It was, that was very difficult service there. Uh, but they performed as they always have, uh, magnificently. And I, none were killed in, during the war in Korea in that basis. There were some lost their lives in getting there and other things, but that was it. And uh, dur in the 1950s, the law was changed to permit male um, people, men, to go into the nurse corps. Up to then, it had been restricted to females. So the one unique thing about World, uh, the Korean War is for the first time we had women who were still uh, in the reserve and they were recalled. And that was the first time we'd ever had a recall of women. And there were some husbands who were quite disturbed when their wives were called and they were gonna be there with the children. And, uh, and they said, but wait a minute, this is all wrong. I am the male. I am the one who should be going in, not you. But it all got settled over time. But we did have women who were recalled. So as you think, you know, as we think about the way things were uh, after about this time in the service and about the time that, that I went in, things were very different for women than they are today. Uh, we didn't fly. We didn't work in maintenance. The thing about women being in aircraft maintenance was gone after World War II. And so we were either in medical or uh, administrative type jobs, and that was it. The, we weren't in any non-traditional jobs. We didn't go to ROTC, that wasn't open. We couldn't go to the academies. Uh, there were, uh, if a woman became pregnant, she was immediately discharged. And I mean immediately, usually the same day she was diagnosed, whether she had a place to go or she didn't. And one of the big things is, if she was married to a, to a civilian, uh, he didn't get an ID card. He couldn't go to the commissary or the base exchange. He couldn't uh, get hospital care. Uh, they couldn't move on base as a married couple. And she didn't get that extra pay that, that males got. That's just the way it was. And uh, so uh, it was not a happy situation for women. And to show you an example of what happened to one woman, uh, I'm asking Marilla Cushman, who's our public relations person and a retired lieutenant colonel, to address what happened to an Air Force uh, lieutenant. This is a note from an Air Force um, women's medical specialist officer who served from 1955 to 1961. And this is what she wrote when she registered in the memorial. She said, it was 1955 and women were still serving in the armed forces or for the armed forces as they always had in one capacity or another. Relative rank was gone and women had been given the same ranks, privileges, and pay as their male counterparts. I had the pleasure of serving in the Air Force Women's Medical Specialist Corps as a physical therapist from 1955 to 1961. The most bizarre thing which happened was being denied base housing because such housing was available only if a woman's ho house husband was handicapped. When I became pregnant with my first child and after informing my supervisor, I was told I'd be separated. But I did work in the hospital. As part of my discharge physical, the examining physician noted an undifferentiated mass in my abdomen. 
He stated to me with a smile that an officer is on duty 24 hours a day. So this had to have been acquired in the line of duty. He said, when I was ready to deliver, I should come back and they would deliver the baby for nothing. My chart read the mass had been successfully removed and the Air Force had fulfilled its responsibilities and the case was closed. So that's how it went one time. And I met uh, somebody who was in the Navy just a couple, three weeks ago. And she uh, went to see the doctor. She wasn't feeling well. He said, you're pregnant. She said, I am not pregnant. And she went away and she went back in a few days and he examined her and he said, you absolutely are pregnant and I'm doing the paperwork for your discharge. And she was discharged. And three years later, her daughter was born. <laughs> so much for that. So, uh, the uh, 1960s brought the Vietnam War. And once again, this was a nurse corps war. There were only 7,500 women who served in Vietnam. About 82% of them were nurses. Uh, I was one of those non-nurses who went. And it was 1966 when General Westmoreland decided that he was have got problems there at the headquarters with paperwork and he wanted some wax, about six or eight wax to be sent over there to take care of the paperwork. And so when that happened, then the, the other services began to try to work to get women uh, assigned there. And I was one of those in 19, selected in 1968 to go uh, over. And uh, basically, if you were a woman, not a nurse, you were stationed at Long Bend, if you were Army, Tonsonut Air Base, if you were Air Force, MACV, there were five, four of us at the time that I was stationed there, women. One colonel, uh, two majors, and one enlisted woman. And uh, Cameron Bay, which was Air Force, and that was it. And so you didn't go anywhere. The Red Cross women, the USO women went all over, but you as a member of the military, non-nurse, couldn't go. And let me tell you, as with every conflict, the story of nurses is one that you cannot overlook because they have given of themselves, given of their lives, and almost given of their futures because they're never able to forget this. And we had eight, only eight women who lost their lives in Vietnam uh, and whose names are on the, uh, the wall there in Washington. Uh, the only one of them was killed by Viet Vietnam uh, shrapnel or anything like that, Sharon Lane. And I've asked uh, Marilla to read the stories of two women, one of whom was her nurse corps chief. This is from Colonel Amelia Carson. She was Sharon Lane's chief nurse. In Coochie, on an early morning in June 1969, I was head nurse of a ward hit by a rocket that killed a young nurse. It was unbelievably painful to have a fellow nurse wounded by shrapnel from a rocket right in the middle of the hospital compound and not be able to save her life. For years, I buried, along with other memories, too painful to live with at the time. The fact that I was the nurse responsible for the ward whose staff and patients were killed and injured. For me, the pain of those men and women still echo in the halls of the 312th EVAC hospital. I can't recall their names, but I still see their faces as if it was yesterday. And this was from First Lieutenant Nancy Spears, also an Army nurse in Vietnam. She said, I went to Vietnam as a young woman and I returned one year later as an old lady inside, never to be truly young again. I would go again without a moment's hesitation, not because I care for war, but because I care for the people who are sent to war. 
My service in Vietnam was a defining experience in my life. And since then, I have measured everything by that experience. Quietly but surely, I will never forget this experience. So if you ever meet an, a nurse from the military, tell her thank you. So uh, that's about Vietnam. So many things happened during that period of time. You know, the, that was such an unpopular war and we had to draft to get people, get men to go in and finally to, to remove the pressure on the draft, it was decided if they took more women in, they wouldn't have to take as many men. And so if they were going to do that, they had to get rid of this 2% rule. So they considered this, and they decided that they would uh, remove the 2% rule. There just wouldn't be a, a percentage. And uh, they would try to get women instead of men to go in. This was in 1967. So if you're going to take more women in, then you've got to do something about this pyramid you've got that goes up to lieutenant colonel or commander and cuts across when you've only got nine colonel positions or captain. And so at the same time, the subject of women and, uh, as admirals or generals came up. So of course, they had to do something about the colonels and, and the, uh, the captains. And, so they decided there was a lot of pressure coming that, that women should have the opportunity to be generals or admirals. And uh, so they decided that uh, they would do that. So same subject came up, menopause. And uh, the Navy Surgeon General stood up and said, gentlemen, I must advise you that men go through menopause too. And that was the end of that. They removed the, the restriction. So in, starting in 1967, uh, women could compete to be a general. So, uh, the, the, but other things were happening in the 60s and the 70s. We had the all-volunteer force come about, and uh, then they couldn't get enough women to go, or men to fill all the positions, and they had to, to start opening some of the specialties that had been closed to women. So that began to take place. And then we had discrimination and we had women's equality. And we had women who started saying, wait a minute, I'm being discriminated against. And they were going to court to fight this. And uh, so it became, all kinds of things came, began to change. The Air Force opened its ROTC program in 1972. Why? They were sued eight times and lost. And so they opened it, and they were followed shortly thereafter by the other services. And um, so then uh, when we think about other things uh, that happened along about that time, there was a lieutenant commander named Alice Cook in the Navy. She came back from vacation, and she wasn't feeling good. And she'd been a nurse for some 13 years, and she felt that she could diagnose what was wrong with her. And she went in and she thought it was, she had the flu. They diagnosed her, she was pregnant. And here, what happens is we were still at this thing that you got discharged if you became pregnant. And here what should have been happy news, that she was gonna have a child. What was it? Her career was coming to an end. She sued. It took 10 years. You know, she wasn't uh, on, she was discharged, but she was suing. And after a 10-year legal battle, the circuit port ru court ruled that it was unconstitutional for the women, uh, the military regulations requiring discharge of mothers with minor children. And so she got 10 years back pay. She had the opportunity to continue her career and uh, it changed. It changed for everybody as a result of her suit and staying with it for 10 years. That was Alice Cook. And then we had the benefits, the entitlements of benefits. And we had a, an Air Force uh, physical therapist, first lieutenant, married to a civilian. Her name was Sharon Frontiero. 
and she was suffering financially. And she uh, went and got counseled, and they said, you're being discriminated against. And she said, what should I do? And they said, you should sue, and you'll surely win. She sued in 1971. She sued the Secretary of Defense. She lost. The case was picked up by the Civil Liberties Unit and went forward to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled that women were entitled to the same benefits as men. And the lawyer who took that case to the Supreme Court was Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She was then a lawyer. And I have spoken to her about this. She is as prouder, she is prouder of this than anything else that she has done in her career, that she got all these benefits for women. And I've talked to Sharon Prontiero. And you know, by the time, in the two years it took to do this, by the time it happened, she was divorced and out of the Air Force. She did get two years back pay. So that was a major decision by court uh, for a woman. And uh, so all kinds of things began to change. And women began to go into career fields they hadn't been able to go into. In uh, many non-traditional fields were open. Nin in 1973, the first Navy woman entered to go into pilot training and got her wings in 1974. 1974, the first Army helicopter pilot got her wings. In 1975, the academies were open to women. And interestingly, there were four women who were suing, and they expected the case to go to the Supreme Court when they decided to open the academies for women. So there was a lot of work to get some of these things done. And in 1978, the Women's Army uh, Corps was disestablished. Uh, so as we think about all of these things, uh, there was then, right about that same time, there was an a E-5 in the Navy named Yona Owens. And she couldn't go on board uh, any kind of a Navy vessel to, so that she could do certain training that she had to have so that she could be promoted again. She sued the Secretary of the Navy. And the district court judge ruled that she was right, that she should be able to do that, that she shouldn't be denied uh, that opportunity to go forward. And so non-combat ships were open to women as a result of one woman, one E-5, putting on her first uh, class uniform and going to court and suing. So we come to Desert Shield, Desert Storm. And this was the first deployment of women at the same, at the beginning of a, of a an operation that we had had since World War II, when Eisenhower was criticized for letting the nurses go in on the invasion of North Africa. So uh, we also learned, and why did the women, were the women being deployed? Because they were in, in uh, various uh, different uh, types of duties that if they, their unit went, they had to take the women or they couldn't perform. And so off they went. And they were flying helicopters. They were flying support aircraft. And after that, and we also learned that the front line concept was gone. If you were assigned to the combat support group, it really didn't mean anything because a missile could get you. So it changed enormously. And um, so uh, it was, we had to learn. And so the women came back from there, the pilots, and they went to Barry Goldwater and they started the fight to open up combat aircraft to women and they were successful. And so the aircraft were opened in 1991 and ships were opened to women in 1993. And so you know why ships hadn't been open to women? Because they didn't have restrooms for women. And amazingly, when it was opened, in three months, they managed to solve that problem somehow. I don't know how, but they did. Okay, and then the, to show you that, that some of the things that were happening to women who were in these non-traditional fields, we have a chief master sergeant.
Chief Master Sergeant Shell McCraw was the 12th woman to graduate from the engine school. She wrote about her assignment to the propulsion branch. Everyone was issued their own toolbox. I can remember the day I was issued mine with all 45 pounds of tools in it. They didn't believe that a woman could carry a 45 pound box. I had to open it and inventory every tool in it in front of them before they would believe me that I was issued all my tools. Because many men did not want women in maintenance, I was often given the toughest and dirtiest jobs to do in hopes that I couldn't do something or would just give up. This just made me even more determined not to give up and to let them beat me. Returning from Desert Storm, she marched in DC in the Victory Parade up front with General Horner. Okay, so then we come to Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm not going to discuss that in any great detail uh, because it's been so much in the news. Uh, I am going to mention a couple of things. But out of that, you know, one I read not long ago where one of the soldiers there wrote, when I served in Iraq, I was a gunner, and my driver was a female soldier. She drove the same truck, carried the same gear, fired the same weapon, uh, targeted the same targets, uh, and was fired upon just the same as any of the men in our unit. And when you think of comments like that, it is small wonder that Secretary Panetta issued the rule that they were removing this uh, thing that said women couldn't be in so many specialties. That was gone. And then that was to be reviewed and to determine what you really needed to be able to do. And so there are probably some of those uh, specialties as a result of that review are close to men now. Uh, so there are many changes have come about. And Secretary Carter uh, has now said all of them are open to everybody and women will be assigned to infantry and armor. So uh, as we think about this time, we had another major incident, uh, major thing that happened. We had a woman who received for the first time the Silver Star in uh, Valor, for Valor in combat. Marilla? And the woman was Sergeant Leanne Hester. And as General said, she was the first woman to receive the Silver Star since World War II and the very first woman ever for valor. And on the skylights at the memorial, uh, we've inscribed what she had to say about that. She said, this award doesn't have anything to do with being a female. It's about the duties I performed that day as a soldier. And this is what her citation read. On March 20, 2005, Hester and her team of military police were guarding a supply convoy near Salam Pak, Iraq. About 50 insurgents ambushed the convoy. Hester maneuvered her team through the kill zone into a flanking position where she assaulted a trench line with grenades and M203 rounds. Her actions saved the lives of numerous convoy members. As you think about Iraq and Afghanistan and women serving in it, this has been some of the results. The women have had the most combat casualties during this war, of any war they've been in. The most wounded, the most purple hearts, the most, uh, they've served in the most specialties. They've had the most with PTSD. They have had, uh, they have written the most books, uh, been involved with the most DVDs, probably had more newspaper articles than in any other. And that's just some of the changes. And of course, one of the big newspaper items not long ago was when three women uh, succeeded in passing the, the uh, uh, Ranger course. And one of them, Kristen, or Kirsten Grice, uh, captain uh, said, I was thinking of future generations of women, that I would like them to have that same opportunity of going to ranger school. So I had that pressure under me. 
all of the way through. And you know, as I think about that, I think about my own career, not that it was anything like that, like going through ranger school. But I was, in my duty assignments, my primary duty, I never was assigned to, a wom to one that a woman had been assigned to before. And I can tell you, it was very much on my mind that I had to succeed so another woman would have an opportunity to have that same job. That's not easy to perform when you have that in your mind. But she made it, and we should be very proud of her. So, you know, where are we today? Well, we have to see how this all works out with the new legislation, the new rules on uh, specialties that women can be in. And so we have a lot to learn, I am sure. And one of the things we need to be careful of is that we don't lose ground, because that can, has happened to us before, and let's hope it doesn't happen again. And the big issue that lies out there yet is the draft. And I was quite surprised not long ago when I had a, a young woman who'd been in the service who was going to college and she was uh, interviewing us about uh, women in the military. And then we said something about the draft and she said, what is the draft? I hope all of you here know what the draft is. And if you don't, you should find out what the draft is because it hasn't gone away. But I feel confident if we're in another crisis, either they will find a way to go around it as they always have, or it will be abolished and women will be subject to the draft. So that remains to be resolved. But, it, but whatever we think about, as we think about the history of women in the military, or we think about people in the military, we as men and women are all citizens and we all have a responsibility to our country to, de to support and defend it. And so I hope that you will live. And not only that, the world is in such a state, we need to work to also try to make a better world for all of us to live in. Now I'd like to close with just a couple, three comments uh, about uh, the memorial. It, as mentioned, it is at the main gate at Arlington National Cemetery. Three million women have served, but only 267,000 are registered. So I have met some here who, are, who served and haven't registered, and I hope you will. And there are lots of other people out there. And we do register people who are no longer living. We register people from obituaries and all things like that. Um, it is, the memorial is one of three edifices, three buildings in the country that pays tribute to a large group of women. The first is the National Women's Hall of Fame in Seneca Falls, New York, in Washington, D.C., the Museum of Women and the Arts, and this memorial in, in tribute to the women who served our country. And uh, it was simply built to honor all of you collectively and to honor you individually through the registration process. Uh, we do... Uh, Lots of uh, retirements and promotions. We've even had three weddings there, so if anybody would like to be wet, married there, you can come and be married, but we don't do divorces. I just want you to know that. Uh, so we have exhibits, we do films, we sell books, we have programs from time to time. We're on the internet. You can reach us at 1-800-I-SALUTE, and we're at womensmemorial.org. We do a calendar, Marilla has worked on it on the airplane coming out. We'll be mailing it soon. And we host a lot of honor flights. And I can tell you, as these World War II women come in and they see this memorial that was built for their service and the tears come to their eyes. We have had the oldest living uh, women, one, uh, 11, no, I think it was, was nine or 11 from Detroit nine years, and we had a woman die just the other day, eight years, and we've had one from Texas, eight years, and they came. They wanted to see their memorial before they died, and they didn't live much longer, but they got to see it. So uh, it is worthwhile, and we do recognize Memorial and Veterans Day, and we'll be honoring those. And I spoke of uh, Sergeant uh, Randy Hall, 
I spoke about Anna Brim. But I want to close with the words of a World War I veteran. I've never known where she was from, but I know that she lived in Rhode Island. And she wrote, I am a woman and a veteran, and I say it with great pride. I gave the very best I had. There is nothing I need hide. I have the right to know that the burden that I bore will always be remembered when they tell about the war. Think about those words. Let us, that day of remembrance is coming up on the 11th. So let's remember all the Janet Taylors and the Randy Halls and the Ann Brims that have served our country. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for coming. We're going to open it up for uh, questions, if you have any, uh, for the general. I do want to say for any of you that are students here on campus, we do have the American Association of University Women student group on campus. And each year, we raise money to take students to Washington, D.C. for our national conference. And that is how I met this wonderful woman, was I was given a tour of the Women's Veterans Memorial and Museum when I went for our national conference. So would love for you to get involved with our group. Uh, if you have any questions about it, you can ask me. But I'm going to open it up for questions. This is very informal. If you want to get up and talk, if you want to get something to eat, I'll leave it there. So, who has a question? All right. Uh, you remember the old Air Force uniform? Well, it's old for me now. Well, we were old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the hat. Before the C cap, we had a book. You remember that? No. Okay. Well, I can't answer it. I got somebody to help. Air Force two. No, I was Army, but I know this is the cap that you're Okay, about. the big bubble cap that looked like felt in the right right. shape. Right before that was when I enlisted, and they gave me a leather, white leather pillbox hat that has blue and a bill. I like the Navy's is right now, only they've got a little uh, ribbon, black, but we had do you remember that hat? Do you remember the, uh, the cap, Joe, that had a bill and a... I don't remember. It was a white... It was a... It was, 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 was a leather pill, pillbox that had a dark baby uh, rim that came out to a bill. Oh, for the Air Force? Yeah. Oh, I remember that. I had still had one of those things. Well, I do too, and it, it was destroyed in a flood. I liked it so much. I do too. Tires. I took it in and laid it on the, the shelf, and I said, you will never put that on again. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any, any way to get it either replaced or fixed? I have I have it. The, the, the inside's kind of being repaired. Do I just need to take it to an after or is there some place I could get a new time? I don't know. We'd have to check that. Okay. Uh, that's that's the person who the archives. Anyone else? That's right. What's the percentage of women in the military today? Do you know? Because it was 2%, and when I retired, it was maybe 7%. It's about it's about 15 right now, but it depends on which service, Marine Corps. I, I, I think the last it was a little over nine percent with the Marine Corps, and the, and the Air Force is something like 25. Yeah, we're, we're way above yeah. 20, about 20 yeah. percent. Is it Army? If you want to go first class, the Air Force. Well, I'm trying to look. Yeah. Yeah. General, you were kind enough to tell us about all sorts of other people, but you didn't tell us about you. What made you decide to go in the Air Force, and how did you get commissioned? We'd like to know how you decided to go into the Air Force and how you got your commission. 
I got my commission because at that time they had such a shortage of women officers that it, they had started in uh, 1955 to offer commissions to, to certain people who had graduated from college and perhaps been employed someplace an opportunity in, to go into the reserve and be called to active duty. And if you were under the age of uh, 28, you went in as a first, as a second lieutenant, and that was the category I was in. If you were 28 and older, you went in as a first lieutenant. Or if you had some special experiences, you might have gone in as a captain. But that was uh, the reason. I chose the Air Force because I talked to, to a couple of Army uh, officers who had been in the Army, and one of them had been in the Army and the Air Force for a number of years, and they told me that the, at that time, you know, when the Army goes to war at that time, it, the, between the infantry and armor and everything, the majority of the people are in those, and that women couldn't serve in any of those, and there weren't that many jobs for women. Where the Air Force, sent the pilot, and maybe a couple of crew members, and off they went. And so there were many more positions for women. And the Air Force had more bases around the world than the Air Force did, and I would have a greater opportunity to go overseas. So I was about, lived about halfway between an Army base and an Air Force base, and I decided to see if the Air Force had a similar program, because I had received a recruiting letter from an Army major and see if the Air Force had a similar program that it did and not in that direction. They had better food. Yeah, we had this saying, if you want to go first class, go Air Force. <laughs> that the Air Force got their money and they built golf clubs and built nice bases and then they went and got their money for the earth uh, for the runway and all the other things. Which is not very true. <laughs> The reason I went in the service was that I always wanted to be in management and supervision and be in charge. And this gave me an opportunity to do that. And I had been working for the DuPont Company at, a, at an atomic energy installation. And they had, I checked their organizational chart. And on their big organizational chart, they had two women. And one of them was the head of a chemistry department. I had a terrible time in chemistry in college. The second one was the treasurer of the company, and her middle name was DuPont, and mine wasn't. That was the only two. So I thought, I must go someplace where there's an opportunity for women. And this was an opportunity because what they said in the letter was I could manage and supervise, and that's what I wanted to do. Anyone else? Over here. What, what did you study in college? What did you study in college, General? I studied, I went in, I, I entered in medi medicine. I was going to be a doctor. And I can tell you, the world was saved because I never <laughs> I never should have been a doctor. Anyway, uh, I went into business. And so then I ended up in the controller field in uh, data automation and management analysis, budget control. Where'd you go? Where did I? What school? What school did you go to? The University of Illinois, because that's the state I lived in. And I got my master's degree, an MBA, master's in business at, uh, administration from the University of Alabama. That's where the Air Force sent me. Anyone else? Wilma? Yes. Do you remember what you said? At your retirement, at the uh, your retirement ceremony at Great Lakes, about I your career in the Air Force. You about what? When she retired, she mentioned that as a officer, as a general in the Air Force, that she had three things against her: size, female, and not flying officer. And she made general. Joe said that when, when you retired, this is General Watts' cousin. When you retired, you, at, at, your, at your ceremony at Great Lakes, you had three things against you. You were a woman, you were short, 
and you weren't pilot. That's true, but nevertheless, you made general ops. I didn't know I said that. <laughs> but I wouldn't be surprised if I said something. <laughs> After all, I was leaving. <laughs> Anyone else? Great, good job. That's great. This is really a question. I just wanted to say thank you. I joined the Army in 1984 and retired four years ago. And when I came in, uh, women, my generation didn't have to break the barriers because yours did. And I just want to say thank you for what you did in the service, as well as what you've done for our memorial. I've been here to this day. Let me just give you an illustration of how far women have come recently uh, in the service. And that is that uh, when I retired in 1985, I was the senior ranking officer in the military service in this country as a brigadier general. There were seven of us. That was 1985, 31 years ago. Today, we have had five four-star generals, two of whom which have retired. I don't know how many three-star generals, two-star generals, and lots of brigadier generals. That's how far we have come in that 31 years since I retired as the senior ranking woman officer in the military service. And I was a senior ranker, right? Because I was promoted sooner than the other six of them. So there wasn't anything special about it. Yes? Uh, there are several of us here from DAR chapters, and we understand that you are a DAR member. She's, she said there, there are several ladies here from DAR chapters, and, and that you, she recognizes that you're a fellow DAR member. I joined the DAR. Uh, it's a very proud organization. And I've had difficulty getting the DAR to register and get its members registered who are members of the military. So I hope you'll help me with they're that. Working, they're working on it. We have okay. two in our chapter right here, not too far from here. Good. Good. You know, I want to tell you another addendum to the Ann Brim story. We wrote uh, uh, about uh, women. Uh, and when she had to go into the nursing home here a couple years ago, she died in, 20, in 19, or 2014. They found out that she had written these words that we have there on the glass tablet. Uh, and they put up over her doorway, let the generations know that women in uniform guaranteed their freedom. And they were going to leave it there permanently after she was gone. So those words live. So I am proud to be a DAR member, an AAUW member, a, 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 an American Legion member, uh, w, <laughs> uh, the VFW member, uh, and almost anything else you name, I'm a member of it. And the reason I am a member of those things is when you're a fundraiser, you, you join everything. <laughs> and, and you may wonder how I became president of the, of the Memorial Foundation. I had retired in 85 and come back to the Washington, D.C. area, and I immediately proceeded to have, uh, have to have my appendix removed, and so that knocked me out for a while. But somebody knew that I'd always been a promoter of women and asked me to be on this board of directors. And I didn't intend to do anything more than be a board member and do what generals do. That's criticize everybody else. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I was sitting at home one evening. Uh, this had started in January. They called me in December of 1986. And in January, we had the first preliminary meetings. And in March of 1987, I got a phone call at home. And it's, uh, Colonel in the Marine Corps, who was a board member, says, why weren't you at the meeting today? And I said, what meeting? And she said, of that 
board that we're on. I said, oh, I forgot all about it. What did you do? And she said, we elected officers, and you're the new president. <laughs> Nine years I was the president. And it was it was an unbelievable experience. And I have talked with women veterans and male veterans that have problems that you wouldn't believe. I hardly believe. I've talked to those who had success almost beyond belief. And it's just been a tremendous experience. And, and I can't tell you uh, how touching it is sometime. Uh, Wednesday, when I get back, we, we go back today, but I'll be going to a fun funeral of a woman that I've probably met in person once or maybe twice. But she was a, one of our charter members, and she sent obituaries in. And over the course of time, I had jotted off about six or eight little notes. She had sent in, her daughter told me, about 1,500 obituaries. And she felt I was a member of the family. And she thought so much of me. And she came to groundbreaking. She has a picture taken of us. And her daughter called. She had asked me if I would come to the funeral, which is a Arlington Cemetery, and I said I would. And then they, they wrote again, and they said they wanted me to sit with the family because their mother thought I was one of the family. And so I will be joining the family on Wednesday. And I'm telling you, you can't imagine how you feel when these kind of things happen to you. It has been a long, difficult walk, but it has been a very touching walk. Anyone else?